Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If there's anyone wishing to come and hear this last discussion of the evening from the British Council, hurrah, hurrah for the British Council, not for the fact that it's the last discussion. Uh, and uh, tonight we'll be talking about imaginations running wild. And with me tonight we've got Philip Ardair, children's writer, writer and artist, Ilya, and uh, writer Jasper Ford. I've decided that uh, we'll kick off the questions based upon the length of beards, <laughs> since we do appreciate a beard in this part of the world. So Philip, it's hard enough creating an imaginary character. Why go to the lengths of creating an imaginary world? I think it, that's, I was really hoping, I was sitting here this evening, and the thing I was really hoping most of all was I hope I don't go first. Because you do. it's a, a very, very difficult question to answer because it pre presupposes many things. I think it presupposes that uh, a writer can choose to write about what he or she wants to with equal skill, ease, desire, and chooses that this is the niche they want to develop. I, I, um, I was doing a writing workshop a little earlier today, and, and I, I write what I have to write. I have a need to write, and I find that that need takes me in certain directions. And sometimes it might take me in a direction where I find myself basing something in, in, a, in a genuine world. Sometimes I'll cheat a little. My Eddie Dickens books are based in a Victorian world, but not the real Victorian, not a research Victorian world, but what you think you know about the Victorians without actually bothering even to look on Wikipedia, however unreliable that may be. So it's sort of, you're not sure what was invented when or who was doing what or who was Prime Minister, but it's sort of a bit of fun. And then in another series such as My Unlikely Exploits, I actually at the beginning of the book say wherever you think this story is taking place, you are wrong. Just because you're reading it and they're speaking English doesn't mean it took place in England. And if you're reading a translated version, it doesn't mean it took place there. So it's just the world is something that is born of the characters, where you're at, where your writing's taking you. Um, it, to me, it's not even a conscious decision. Ilya, does, it have to be, does there have to be a reference to the real world, whether it's historical or, or today? Um, I, think, I think Philip's uh, very broadly right. Uh, I, I think nothing does beat the power of the imagination. Um, and even when I've done research work, um, the guesswork that I've let my imagination do and I've let it free has, has largely um, proven accurate. So uh, I imagined you know, the right answer to the questions I had, luckily. Um, but I think, I think you know, it's part of the point of writing is to, is to set the imagination free and let it go where it will and let it surprise you as much as it would surprise the reader um, and inspire the reader, hopefully. So, yeah, that's the short answer. Jasper, what's your take on the uh, imaginary world? Where do you begin? Um, well, I, I, I tend to create imaginary worlds out of, out of a necessity um, because the ideas that I have for my books, because I start, cent the central nub um, of the way I start a book is to um, have an idea. Uh, and usually that idea cannot take place in our world because it is a bizarre idea, it's a strange idea and it, it wouldn't work here. So, so to give credibility to my bizarre notion that I want to actually write about, I have to make the world slightly different to fit in with the slightly strange idea. And, and that's slightly a sort of reverse way almost of, of looking at a way of creating an imaginary world. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to give um, credibility uh, and relevance to a very, very strange idea. And the best way to do that is when you hide a stick. The best place to hide a stick, of course, is in a forest. And the best place to make an, a bizarre idea that you want to seem commonplace, because the best ideas that you ever have as an author, you really want to make them appear really very ordinary, um, because that is the best way to, I think, play with bizarre ideas, is just make them seem ordinary. Is, of course, put them in a, in a world in which those ideas seem ordinary. So, um, so my, my imaginative worlds, of which some are very, very odd indeed, are only there essentially to give credibility to the, uh, the central uh, idea in the story. 
Can I just pick up something uh, that you said, Eric, and think it in your question too? It was, um, I think you, you said um, about having to touch with some level of reality. Because I think if, if, if an imaginary world was so off the scale, you would have no point of reference. I was in a, a Radio 4 discussion back in England the other week because as well as this being Dickens' bicentenary, it's also Edward Lear, the, the nonsense writer. And we're saying if something is utter nonsense, you would read the first few lines and then discard it as being genuine nonsense. So in our imaginary worlds, they at some stage have to have something recognisable. They have some, something that touches. So you have a world where people care about each other or where there's conflict or whether there is routine or people live in houses. You find, so within that, you're giving credibility and you're using your non-fiction skills. You're describing in a way you would something very real. And then to that, you're adding this imagined crazy whatever um, you're interweaving it so it seems seamless and on top of that you have the internal logic because I'm sure that's something we'll be talking about mm. all important rules that you have within your world and, and Ilya what do you think about this idea that um, uh, we were just discussing about the idea of having this bizarreness to the world uh, and then making it ordinary I mean does that does that have well, to be there the more, the more bizarre the more sorry the more bizarre and unlike our world that it is the more its internal logic engine needs to work because what you're doing is inviting the reader or the viewer into that other world, that other reality, but they have to believe it if it's going to impact on them, on their heart and on their mind and make them feel or think. So um, the internal logic or the integrity, as I call it, of that world is very, very, you know, or that universe is very important. Uh, one of the things I was um, saying earlier on is, is uh, when I do workshops, I do a couple of those a term, um, schools, libraries, whatever, wherever I'm invited to go, and often when you're dealing with teenagers, they have a very, very alive, you know, their communication skills are damped down because they're going through the teenage years and all that involves. But they have this internal engine going on that they're creating universes in their heads and doing galactic epics. And, and some of them, you know, you cross question them and they have the answers. They, they, they've worked out those points of reference so that uh, they're actually constructing something like an alternate life. And we're seeing that happen for real. We were talking about this earlier on. So that's now being played out for real, uh, as it were, within the virtual world when people are joining a thing called Second Life and taking on ab avatar that might not even be human and, and living a daily existence purely as a, a created character on the web. So that even crosses over now into real behaviours of what we're doing. Jasper, where, where do you stand on the galactic epic? <laughs> um, <laughs> the galactic epic. Um, I think um, when it, well, if you're talking about science fiction, um, the, the biggest problem with science fiction is trying to find the, uh, the heart in it. Um, I think a lot of science fiction writers do get carried away with um, the technology too much. I, I love science fiction, but I like it when it's more, um, when, it's more when, when the human side is told, uh, and I really like that in science fiction. I, I think that the important thing about galactic empires or any amazing worlds is that they're only the canvas. They are only the backdrop, and you cannot make them uh, become too prominent and be the, 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 you know, the, the most important thing in the, uh, in the book. The, the story has to be king, always. And, and the thing about writing is the thing about making a good movie or whatever. If you can get all the elements working, then, then you can get towards writing a better book. And if the background works, and the foreground works, and the characters work, and the dialogue works, then it all adds up. It's all an immersive experience. Um, so, so when we talk about creating bizarre worlds, um, it, this is the canvas that we do behind, right? And it can be very, very detailed, and it can have a fantastic logic to it. But it always, whenever we do this, we make sure that it is the canvas and not the most important thing in the book. Yeah, Philip, agree? Uh, yes, absolutely. And of course, as well as plot, the key thing is character. Because the very nature of a, of a human being is you are responding to the way in which the character reacts and relates to other characters. Uh, and it could well be that they are very human, so however alien the environment is, we relate to how human they are. Or we may have characters who are of interest to us because they're so diametrically different to humans. They are a, a creation of, along with the world, but it all comes back to how you relate to 
these characters within the environment because you can have the most wonderful, wonderfully realised world but you, there has to be something that leads us through it and, and I, particularly I, I would think in children's book where plot is more important you can spend much more time in an adult book philosophising and things for, for younger children, I would say, as well as that plot, you need characters. And once the characters draw you in, if you, the author or illustrator, is comfortable with that world, it's safe. Because I think we'd all agree, talking about the amount of detail you put into creating a world, you don't put everything you know about the world onto the page. It's like research. You wear your research lightly. And I've read historical novels where I see that the author has found out all these facts and can't wait to impart them and so overload you with the historical detail that it gets in the way. And then there are the authors in a throwaway line will say something wonderfully relevant and historical. And you think, if they know that about that tiny thing, I'm in a safe pair of hands and they don't need to bombard me. So we will know much more about the world than we put on the page, but it is the canvas, as um, Jasper said, in which our characters lead us through the plot. Uh, Ilya, would you say that the, where the success is, is where an author can uh, sort of avoid becoming almost pedantic about the world that they're creating uh, in order to make sure that the story goes through it? it almost, yeah, it almost requires the same author to be their own editor. And uh, if you're fortunate, you end up working with an editor you can trust who understands what you're doing and can help be your your kind of policeman if you don't have the internal policeman at work to, to uh, kind of control the splurge because uh, one, of, one of the ways I, uh, I spoke about um, uh, the, the act of writing or creating something before was it's, like you're, it's almost like you're channeling and when you get into the zone the stuff is you become a portal and the stuff flows out of you now that doesn't necessarily mean that it, ha that it makes sense um, so then the job of the writer is to try and interpret what you've just channeled. And sometimes it comes out absolutely pure. I mean, I get dialogue scenes, I get whole plot lines in my dream state, you know, when I'm asleep, just ordinary, dream, ordinary sleep and dreaming, and I keep a notepad by the bed to write this stuff down. And quite often you look at it and you think, I have no idea why I thought that was impressive or, or, or made any sense at all at the time. But other times it's, fu it's fully formed and you think, wow, I could just print that on the page, it's there. Um, but yes, I mean, you have a responsibility to your reader, not imagining who your reader might be necessarily, and certainly not in marketing terms, limiting it to a C1, you know, 12 to 15 year old boy or whatever. Marketing is, a, is, a, is killing, a, a killing thing on, on creation and creativity and books and film and all that as well. The more money involved, of course, the more heavily the marketing influences things. But um, just in terms of... of, of being able to think, well, if I'm the reader of this, uh, and, and yes, allowing room for the reader. So, so again, with historical novels, um, allowing room for them to visualize and move within the place you've created for them as well. And also room to imagine um, That's uh, the time and the place you're writing about, if it was a real time and place. You cannot, you have to imagine being there because you weren't there. And you have to let, trust your imagination to run free around it and, and come up with the goods. We were, so we were was, that was very rambling, sorry. I was, I was talking quite shortly, uh, in, in, in um, I was talking to someone uh, the other day about writing um, you know, a, a book about you know, a, a different fantastic world and they were explaining all about it and everything and I said, um, have you ever considered taking, chopping off the first chapter and actually starting your character in the second and see actually if you lose that much because you'll find that it, even if you put in little hints about this world that is not fully formed, your, your reader will still pick up a huge amount of it. And, and there's a lot to be said for that, is, is that um, you know, a lot of exposition is perhaps not necessary. You can hint at a, at a bigger world much easier and much better and much quicker than actually explaining uh, about the world uh, that you're doing. Of course, so, very, sorry, just very famously, The Lord of the Flies, um, has a, a, the first chapter was thrown away. Oh, really? um, in the Golding wrote it, he had them on the plane, he had the plane crash, he had yeah. all this yeah. and the, his editor at Faber said actually if they're, if they're on an island and there's a wreckage of a plane and there are no adults about 
it does the story for you and it made it the book it is let's yeah. not deny the rest of it is superbly written but i think that's a, re a really really good example of the light touch can i also just really quickly talk about i think it, as, as a writer we talk about that being in the zone i talk about it being on a roll and it can sound very poncy it can sound very um airy fairy arty farty but it is so true that sometimes writing, whether you're creating worlds, when, when you're creating, sometimes um, it can be hard work. I think uh, Douglas Adams said writing was easy. It was, it's like banging your head on a blank piece of paper till the blood forms words. He found it very, very difficult. It looked very easy on the page. Uh, but when you're in the zone, when it's working, it is this most incredible thing where you do feel almost that you're not a part of it. And, it, and, and, and it's coming through you. And that's a very interesting process when you then go back and look at what you've written. So I heard a lovely version of the, the, um, the notebook by the, the bed when a very famous author said he, he, he often really felt that he dreamt these amazingly wonderful things and he wished he'd written them down. So he put a notebook by the bed and he had one of these dreams and he wrote it down and he went back to see it and he was just, oh, this is wonderful. And the next morning he read it and it said, <laughs> And I think we've had those, those, those <laughs> yes. moments as well, haven't we? There's, Philip, there's obviously a need in the reader to, to absorb these imaginary worlds. What do you think it is in the human psyche that needs to, needs to be able to explore that? I is think, it just pure escapism? I, I think escapism in the sense of, oh, this is my life, I want something more. No, but I think it's, it's human nature. I mean, we have genres, we have pastiche. We have uh, novels that are genuinely about quests in fantasy lands. Then we have Terry Pratchett type novels that are, again, he's very true to his internal logic. He doesn't just create something to throw it away as the books progress. He tries to be loyal to what is created, but within that he can have operas happening, films happening, quests happening. So it's just, it's there. It's there to be enjoyed, to be explored. We want to look at all types of artwork. We want to look at splatter paintings. We want to look at realistic art. We want to look at... We're back to a canvas. The canvas is blank and we can do what we like with it. And if we can create that and we also as readers can, can enjoy that, share with it, extrapolate, it's just a wonderful thing. But I just think it's human nature. Ilya? Um, that question actually scares the hell out of me. <laughs> um, uh, for somebody whose partner is a psychologist, one thing I don't do is analyze. And I think I prefer to keep it that way. Um, I, I worry that if I analyze, I will lose, I will lose the, the thread or uh, I will panic and the, shut, the loom in my head, the, shut, the shuttle starts going back and forth and just makes noise. So when it's exploring what part of the human psyche makes us want to... <laughs> I, Jasper. <laughs> Jasper. Um, no, I mean, when I first started giving talks like this, I've been, I've been writing now for professionally for 12 years. Uh, but when I first started giving talks and people asked questions like you do... Like Sorry. This, no, no, no. No, no, not at all. Um, I, I don't mind at all. Um, uh, I, I didn't really know, because I'm actually a self-taught writer, I, I, had no, I had no names for all the tools in the toolbox that I was using. I was using the same tools as anyone uses. It's just a, storytelling is natural to humans. I, it's not something... We learn, we have it, everyone has it. Um, the skills we have is that we can spend 10 hours in front of a keyboard uh, for you know, six years at a time and eventually you know, knock out a, a novel. Um, no, so I mean, what I used to do is when people ask me questions, I used to say, uh, I don't know, it, sa it seemed like fun. And, and there is a lot of that to when you're writing is you go, that's a good idea, I enjoy that idea, I'm gonna put that idea together because it's fun. It actually makes me happy, the construction of the way it all works. Uh, and when you are writing and things are working for you, it's actually a tremendous buzz. Um, it really is. You do kind of feel as though you're surfing on the, on the crest of this wave and everything's coming together. And it's a wonderfully um, exciting time. But for the most part, um, I think any author will tell you they're writing primarily for themselves. And if it works on the page and it works for them and it makes that, that feeling work well, then, then it's happening for you and it's right and you're in the zone and everything's working. And you don't think about the rest. You know, what is the big deep meaning of this? Yes, in a broad sense, um, but really you're doing it for fun and you like it, it's enjoyable and it's working for you. I love it when people um, tell me why I've done things. Yes. It's very, yes. very popular in America. If you're on panels in America, it's science fiction bookshops. 
you will have people who will stand up in the audience and will for 10 minutes explain to you exactly why you did what you did in your books. Um, as a children's author, I love it that I get letters from children and I quite understand very, when they're very young children they want to tell me what's happening in my own story. You accept that and then they say what bits they like. But when an adult stands up and tells you very cleverly, and once someone explained one of my books so well to me, um, I didn't know why I'd done these things, but they were very clear on why I'd done them, that I have since used their answers um, <laughs> to explain it when I've been asked about it. There is um, a module um, at one of the um, universities in London where there is a module about children's literature, and within that there was a, a small segment about my Eddie Dickens books, and um, it has an unreliable narrator and various things in it, and there was they were comparing it with Tristram Shandy and they were saying I got this bit from there and this was a very clever copy and, I'm, and I've never read Tristram Shandy so I had to make the decision do I tell them that and then I'm no longer a module of this training pay or I just keep quiet so you can guess I'm a very shy retiring person so I thought I'll keep quiet and let them keep peddling this detritus because we don't know the words for a lot of things we do you find out later on we're all self-taught and it is, we talk about the hard work and all that, but there is that fun element. I think Jasper's nailed it. When it's going well, you are being paid to make this pretend into something and to share this pretend. And, and if it goes well, people are nice to you about it. And that's fantastic. That's wonderful. Mm. If there's anyone who wants to stand up and tell Philip what his books are about, <laughs> that would be, be fantastic. And I'm going to open up the floor to questions in a moment. But just a one question for all three of you before we get there. And that's about visualization, you know, actually visualizing the worlds that you create. And, um, you know, how important is that in terms of when you're actually writing? Um, when it comes... I'm just going to take this very literally to begin with. Um, the words I choose to describe something can have a direct effect on the direction the story takes me. In, in the process of the actual writing, I can find that if I use a word, that imagery might take me off at a tangent and take me into a whole direction I wasn't expecting. So for me, the actual words are of primary importance. I'm not somebody, some people make models of their characters. I'm thinking of a particular one. He's, he makes superb models of his um, fantasy characters. Some people draw maps of the places. I am more vague than that. But when it comes to discussing with the illustrator which elements I would like to be illustrated, I will discuss it in great detail. So it's not that I go, oh, I'm not visual, I'll leave that to you. I will talk to the illustrator, talk about what I feel. The illustrator may then come back with something surprisingly different that makes me stop and I might in some cases go no well this is wrong because or I might go yeah wow that's amazing it's like if you write something and then later it's performed whether in stage or in film or whatever after a while Inspector Morse becomes John Thor the character and if you're writing Inspector Morse you're probably seeing John Thor in a way you weren't, weren't before but I don't think I don't see it all. I'm not someone who, who pictures it all. Ilya, as an artist and a writer, perhaps you've got a, a unique perspective on this. Uh, I should explain that my field is, is comics, uh, manga, graphic novels, whatever you want to call it, but uh, basically panel-to-panel -panel continuity, long-form uh, comic strips. That's, that's what I do. Um, uh, and for the most part, I do write and draw those. Uh, I think what that means, I, often um, a, a very quick, uh, um, uh, oh god, <laughs> I'm losing my words, uh, actually, draw okay. it. <laughs> I know, uh, when I go like this, yes, it's probably easier for me to draw, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, so I'm losing certain words in my vocabulary and I can't explain what I wanted to explain, but okay, um, language in comics is not secondary to the pictures, it runs in a complementary uh, line, it can contradict, it can complement, it can hint, it can undercut, it can use many ways. So I'm running on a parallel thing, and you're absolutely doing it wrong if it says, you know, Jack jumped through the window, and you're showing Jack jumping through the window. There's no point. Um, I, c I can express something else entirely because I'm showing you the act and how big the window is, all of that stuff. 
So um, it's actually quite a pure, a pure kind of a mode of expression going on there. Uh, and and uh, a constant interplay and balance you're doing. Um, now I have experience as well of, of writing fiction. I've done a historical novel. And in a way, uh, I, am a visual, I am a visual person. I'm visually wired. I had to imagine and visualize the world, describe it a little to the reader, and then take about a third of it out because I'd over-described it. In order to conjure it, to see it, I had completely described it. And uh, people will still say my stuff is, is quite visual. They can see it playing as a movie in front of their eyes and so on. Uh, but I had to take out a good chunk because I was over-verbalizing to make up the fact that the images weren't there. My other experience was, in contrast to what I would normally do, which is comic strip, is that there were certain things I could express in comic strip quite a few whole scenes or certain images, I could not express them with words alone um, or get that fine balance or the subtle points. I couldn't do it. So uh, although I have them as little, little thumbnail drawings, I, uh, I had to leave those ones out, uh, realizing that the two forms, uh, words and images together or images on their own telling a story or words on their own, they were quite distinct. Uh, so I had to kind of double double dare my skill set. <laughs> Jasper, when you sit down to write in the morning mm. and your, the words are coming out, do you actually watch the movie in your head? Is it, is it going um, on in your head? I, I, I tend to, yes. I, I, I tend to think up where this location is uh, and then um, really, I mean, what, what Ilya was saying is that you tend to try and describe it as best you can and you end up using 100 words and then you try and cut it down to about nine. <laughs> um, uh, it, a tremendously hard description. Um, I would say that everyone can do narrative, most people can do dialogue, um, but description is a gift. Um, some authors do it so fantastically well, I want to sort of prostrate myself on the floor when I'm reading it. Um, I'd love to be able to quote, there's a, a fantastic um, opening um, to uh, Brideshead Revisited when they're talking about an English summer. Um, I have been there before it begins and I can't remember the rest of it. It is so unbelievably um, good and precise and fantastic. And it's an opening paragraph. It's probably about 42 words long. And it conjures up exactly a sort of late summer's day um, in Britain to a degree that is uh, phenomenally uh, good. And uh, you can almost smell the buttersweet in the air. It's just fabulous. I wish I could do that. But um, I, I'm not so good at description, so I tend to try and use the shorthand as you can, as, as little words as possible, just to give a hint and then, and then hope that the reader will make up the shortfall in my own descriptive, uh, um, <laughs> descriptive. But also, you, I mean, I, 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 I was obviously paid to do it, but I have read some of Jasper's books. And, um, Thank you. <laughs> and thoroughly enjoyed them. Uh, but, I mean, you, you, you can describe through dialogue, I mean, isn't it? One has to remember that, you, that a writer has those tricks available. The, um, wow. a, a comment, a part of you, if, if you don't have to say it's boggy ground, you can either have someone stepping in it, and you say they step in it, or you can have them reacting to it. You can, you can comment, people can comment yeah. and bring in. So even if a writer is saying he's not being descriptive in the sense that he is in a few lines painting a few broad brush strokes, just by the very way the characters interact and things, you've got those tricks yeah. available yeah. To, to sustain your world. Jasper, have you read any of Philip's books for money? Y yes, I've read them all for money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, have we got any questions from the audience? Got a microphone there. It would be a shame not to use the microphone, so if someone could come up with a question, that would be great. Oh, uh, yes, we have. We have. Uh, here we go. Hello. Um, I have a question to Philip and Ilya, probably uh, because it's... Uh, All three, please. Hope. <laughs> oh, yes, because it's, it's about uh, writing, writing for kids, writing for children. When you write for children, when you illustrate for children, do you consider their nationalities? Because uh, I kind of think that the view kids might see the world might be very different according to geographical location. And I mean, from my experience, I always remember that when I read some um, tales like from other countries, they were not as close for me as like ones from my country. So, right. could, I, could I ask where you come from? Uh, I'm come from Georgia. Okay. 
Right, thank you. Um, I think that's a really interesting question because it gives me an opportunity to plug one of my own books. So I really appreciate I should say we're not related. I've never met this man before. Um, but I, I wrote a, a book called Awful End. And I didn't write it as a, as, as a book. I wrote it as a series of letters to my nephew. So I had no thoughts about it being published. And because I was writing it for one, I was writing it for myself as well, but for myself and this one boy, I didn't think about anything other than enjoyment. And of all the books I've written, and I've written lots of books, that book is in 34 languages and sells in 68 plus countries around the world. So what it says to me is when they have these publishing meetings, and they say, we should have an American girl in it because Hollywood is more likely to make a movie. We shouldn't have this in it because they won't understand that outside Europe. I think that's a distraction because I think if you can write a story that a human being, in this case a child, can engage with, a good translator, and you can tell how good a translator is by the questions they ask you, can smooth over some of those possible things. Um, I had a, a, a Japanese translator who did a rough translation of Awful End, this book, and then she came to England to meet me so we could discuss some of her points in more detail. And we came, and I remember, I distinctly remember her first question. She said, in your book, you say that the boy, Eddie Dickens' father, um, suffered so badly from vertigo that once when he was on tiptoe, he had to be talked down by a group of passing philosophers. And I said, yes, what is your question? And she said, where were the philosophers passing from? And I said, um, they were having a picnic. So she wrote down, having a picnic. And she said, in your book, you say that um, Eddie's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Dickens, had a disease that made them go crinkly, yellow around the edges, and smell of old hot water bottles. Um, and the cure, suggested cure, was to suck ice cubes shaped like famous generals. And I said, yes. And she said, which generals? <laughs> so I said, generic generals. Any, just so she wrote down any generals. And at the end of this, we did lots of bowing. And she said, when I did the rough translation, because the book was set in Victorian times, when I did the rough translation, I tr translated it as though you were Charles Dickens. Now I have met you, I will make it more stupid. So I know she's a good translator. So my answer is make the story good, get a good translator, and you're fine. You're fine. Jasper? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I've written a couple of children's uh, stories. They, they've only, over the last couple of years, so they haven't been fully um, you know, translated yet. We've sold them mostly in uh, Europe at present. Um, but again, I'm not sure you know, where they're going to travel to. Um, my, uh, I, the, the sort of... Uh, the, the literary heritage culture that I know is, is, is predominantly where I'm from, in Great Britain. So I tend to write, obviously, with that, uh, with that in mind. Um, I don't tend to look at, you know, global, what, what's going to work everywhere, um, because, again, I primarily write for myself and what I find enjoyable. But uh, my other books, I think I'm in published in uh, 22 languages, and, and these are books about, basically, about um, English literary heritage, um, which, which makes me um, realise that, of course, um, although we say Shakespeare and Dickens are British authors, they're actually really a global brand now. Shakespeare is a global writer. He is, he is performed in every single language around the planet, um, which makes him uh, a citizen, a writer of the planet, rather than a writer from Stratford. Um, so, and, and because you know, we all write and, and a lot of stories have very similar themes because we're all human and we all have uh, similar things that we're interested in. Um, I think it's actually easier than we think to uh, translate a lot of our stories into really any language there is uh, on the planet. Ilya, somebody who writes in, uh, who draws, sorry, in manga comics, which of course is originally Japanese, um, I mean, how do you see that uh, discussion about uh, the references that go into, into the work? I think the one thing that I, I, I don't want to do is deny the part of the imagination, the imagination of the reader. So, um, I, I don't necessarily go to books looking for any reflection of me, my life, my culture. I go there both as author, author and reader to find out about other worlds, other headspaces, other states of mind. And I think children are equally as open to that, if not more open to that, uh, than many adults. You, you do get into different, more, more subtle questions when it comes to religion or spiritual things or... or 
imagery even with my stuff, so a lot of Japanese manga is misinterpreted around the world um, because of the cultural differences, and they are more different uh, than we can possibly encompass in their whole uh, history and current setup and, and their mind space, but that's also the attraction of it for a lot of people. So uh, I do not try to overthink about who my audience is or what they want to know. Um, there is quite a selfish act to writing. Um, and as far as I'm aware, uh, I'm told my stuff is, is quite British. And I have no problem with that. That's, that's where it's coming from. And it will be perceived and, and received uh, with that understanding. Um, um, just, to just to embellish the point that Jasper just made there about Shakespeare and global brand, you know, we're not just talking about developed nations or, or uh, a theatre group here or Morocco or something like that. Um, I've become aware in the last year of, uh, as their own initiative, uh, Zulus putting on Shakespeare, um, Native American Indian tribes putting on Shakespeare, and Aborigines putting on Shakespeare. They understand the universal messaging written by a 400-year-old dead Englishman uh, because that was, he was a good writer <laughs> and there's a reason why he still lives. Uh, uh, so I think if you, if you write the honest truth, um, it's going to communicate on some level to someone else and they'll appreciate the honesty of it. Another question. Any question? Why are we here? <laughs> what does it all mean? Where are the toilets? Oh, here, we go. here we go. Ah, a question. Thank you. As writers of imagination, or how far imagination can go, what, what are the particular, particular styles or crafts that each one of you resort to when he sits and put himself to paper? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Right. What, uh, what are the, um, what are the tactics, crafts. the crafts that you use when you sit down to uh, face your story? Um, do you have any particular ticks? And, uh, right. Firstly, thank you for coming to me again, Eric. <laughs> I feel <laughs> a theme of Longest beard. The longest, longest beard. The theme, the theory uh, of the longest beard. Edward, Edward Lear look um, like. I, uh, oh, right. No. Um, early, earlier on, um, I was doing a, a workshop, which I'm delighted to say this, uh, this um, gentleman was at, and I was saying one of the advantages of being a professional writer is that you get to put in the hours. Um, there's this famous talk about 10,000 hours, where if you're working for Microsoft, or if you're a musician, or something like this, there's this magic figure that if you put in that amount of work, if you had a seed of talent or a skill at the outset, you achieve something. We have the luxury here that we are paid to do what other people squeeze into an hour and evening or whenever they can. So before we even put pen to paper, we know we have the time to let things fester. I think the nearest comparison I can make is to a film director with an enormous budget knowing that he can do all these things he's wanted to do and he has other experts who have the technology and the ability to create anything he wants. The difference is we are all of those things. Maybe if we can't draw and we need an illustrator, but otherwise it's entirely us. So knowing that, we can make mistakes. We can go down blind alleys. We don't have to have a perfect first draft. Everybody works in a different way. Everybody writes in a different way. People plan, people see where it takes them, go back and revise. But we have that luxury. So I cannot say um, this is the way to do it. I can say how I do it. I can say that I'm not someone who has lots of post-it notes. I have a rough idea. I see where the writing takes me. Some days I have pages that appear in the final book with barely a, a, a letter changed then I may have a piece that I have to rewrite. Obviously, if the story takes me in a direction I wasn't expecting it to go, I then go back and introduce that possibility earlier or a character so that that can happen later on. But I have the luxury of time. So it's using the skill you've acquired over time with the luxury of time. You develop it, you try, you know what doesn't work, and you just build and build and build. I'm sorry I can't be more specific. Uh, Jasper, in a, in a parallel universe, you were telling me 
the parallel universe being Dubai, um, you were telling me last night of your technique of writing, which was uh, very interesting. Tell oh, us a little bit about that. Yeah, there's sort of one, one particular uh, idea that I've been really working on ever since I started writing. I started writing short stories uh, in 1988, and that was my way of getting into the whole story writing thing, because uh, as I said, I have no uh, particular um, uh, training in, in writing. Um, and what I used to do is I used to set myself a narrative dare, um, a challenge. So I used to think up the most bizarre idea possible, and then I used to challenge myself to make sense of the idea, to write a short story in which um, the, the, the central idea could function as an idea without seeming stupid or silly or whatever. Um, and, I, and I found actually that this has, has actually um, really worked throughout my career. So whenever I, 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 I attack a new book, I give myself three or four narrative dares. Um, to give an, an example, in one of these, um, in a book I wrote um, a couple of years ago, I had, this, uh, I had a, a, a teenage son at the time who, who wasn't talking very much and getting up quite late and, and not doing terribly much. Um, and, and I thought, how can I have a teenager who saves the world by doing nothing? Right, that was my challenge. And I thought this would appeal to any parents who have a teenager uh, uh, teenage children of, them, of themselves, or even to any teenagers if they could be bothered to read. Um, you know. so, so that was my challenge. And it's actually quite a hard one to save the world by doing nothing. Um, but the great thing about narrative dares and narrative challenges is it really, really makes you work hard because it's a sort of narrative gymnastics, if you like, a contortionism to try and set up a situation and then pay off the situation in which a teenager saves the world by doing nothing. Um, his very inaction is, is what's required to save the world. And, and you come up with some wonderful, wonderful ideas. But the, the trick about it is you have to never let yourself off the hook um, and, and say, right, now this is a challenge, this is a dare, I have to actually uh, deal with it and make it work. Um, and, and I think many authors, um, you know, if they think about it, they actually go, yes, I've done something very similar, is give yourself an idea. You're not allowed to be let off the hook and you have to use some tremendous ingenuity to make it work. And it's amazing what you can come up with, new ideas to make that work, idea work. Ilya, what about you? Any, uh, any techniques, tricks that you use to get yourself, get the flow going? Uh, I'm kind of going to respond to the original question and, and the answers there in that um, Philip talked about being time rich to do the work that's necessary. And so when I, my, my ordinary, my living is making the comics and the manga. When I came up with a project that seemed better done in prose, I had to buy the time to write the book in prose and to learn how to write in prose in a way that would work for me and then the world. Um, and uh, the, so I'm talking about this book here as a non-graphic novel, uh, as a prose novel. And uh, basically there's 10 years of me buying time in there. There might be gaps of two, two and a half years where I can't work on it. Uh, and uh, when I am working, I'm working double time to have a third job, which is buying the time off, to have sessions sometimes a month here or there. Um, at the most, I had about two months at any one stretch to work on the art of, of doing that. And now where it reflects back on um, Jasper's answer there is that I had to put I, the challenge that was set up for me. Um, it's about a, a, an Australian Aboriginal experience of Victorian London. <laughs> now, that's actually based <coughs> on real historical events. Uh, a, a cricket team brought over from Australia of Aborigines to, uh, 15 years before the first white team came, played the first international team to play from anywhere around the UK. So that was a real event, but all we know of the Aborigines is their, their given names, the date they landed, a few match reports of how their cricket was, and one of them dying, and the fact that he died on this particular day. And I wanted to tell his story, but that was the only historical record for him. He had no voice, and nobody ever, if they did ask him at the time, it was never recorded what his experience was. The displacement and coming here, so so divergent. So I had to imagine, uh, the, the tasks I had was imagine Victorian London, imagine being an Australian Aborigine, and then how would I feel and react and act being here? Uh, and then um, my mediator um, character that I set myself, so the only created character of the three in the book, uh, the s three central characters, um, was a Victorian woman. Um, and I kind of chose, chose these people because of they had no voice. 
at the time, or they had no, no necessary function at the time uh, in various ways. Uh, and the, the other third character follows that route. So I'm being a woman, I'm being a Victorian, I'm being an Aborigine. It has to be a work of the imagination. And I research it to the hilt to set myself free and run in that world of the imagination. Now, the other uh, point, uh, very quickly, um, is that I will quote, uh, quote the, the great goddess Nike, um, just do it. Mm. That's the main thing. Mm. Um, uh, when I do workshops, or, or even in any public thing here, I could do a show of hands and I'd say, um, who likes drawing? And the majority of people, even children, will say, oh, I can't draw. And I say, this is not allowed, we can't say this. What you're saying to me is, I don't draw. If, if you draw, you can draw, you are drawing. If you draw every day, you become better in some way or other. The world might not agree with you, but it does you good. You are drawing, so just do it. Um, uh, the only thing that stops people is confidence, uh, which, which might be down to their lack of self-confidence, or they might get a bad reaction off somebody whose opinion they respect, or just the fear of it, just the fear of committing. But uh, nothing's, nothing's going to stop you writing or drawing if you want to. <coughs> Okay, let's have one last question before we wrap up for the night. Hang on a sec. Let's have that microphone there. Sorry. Um, do, do you always know what your ending is when you start your book, or does Good it question. sometimes change? Oh, Philip, do you want? Do you want to start oh, that one? What a surprise! Hello. Um, I usually think I do. But I don't always. Um, it, is, it is a journey of discovery. And also, uh, if, as I'm not someone who plans it, when you're planning it in, with your cards and things, you're plotting it in your mind. When you're writing it and see where you take, it's taking you, it is still a plotting of sorts, because it's not like you're just going to write it and there it is. You might write the whole first draft, go back, rework it, change it, talk about those things where I'm saying about introducing ideas earlier on. You might actually, and it's even easier nowadays, because you don't have to do the old thing of cutting and pasting physically with scissors and all that. You can do it all on screen. You could be constantly redrafting as you go along. So you may have a book where you feel the first two thirds are much, much more polished than the final bit. But I don't, I don't say the journey's going to be A, it's going to end B, definitely. And also, um, it's how you, how you tell an ending. Where you, I mean, I love that quote where you could say, any book can have a happy ending, it just depends where you end it. I mean, that's so true. The other thing is when you've written a story and people say to you, what happens next? And you as the author can with great confidence say, I don't know. This is as far as I chose to take the story. It has a life as its own. I may one day choose to carry it on. But I don't have it written concrete. But I usually have an idea of a, of, of a story arc. But there are many occasions where I've been very pleasantly surprised and it becomes something completely different. Ilya? Sorry, what's the question? The question was, do you know how your stories end before you start? Uh, broadly, no. Like, like exactly what Philip said, really. Uh, you have an idea, but it's not necessarily the correct one. And usually when you've just written an ending, whatever time it happens, you go, oh, that's the ending. And it doesn't mean you have to finish the book there. You might just take that and move it, or, or what you managed to say there, move it. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 it happened by surprise, uh, certainly in, in the novel. Um, th there's a thing where, when, when I'm doing a, a, a graphic novel of any sort, usually, uh, the format of the book is decided and the length of the book is decided. Uh, but, but the way I, exp I explain doing one of those is it's like playing a concertina. It's the pacing um, is, is like a squeeze box. It's like you're lengthening some things and you're letting other things expand. And uh, mainly I play the concertina when I'm doing comic strips because comic strips rely a lot on the pacing. You're dictating a certain pace to the reader but it's very interactive and then the reader is also receiving the information, decoding the information, because it's quite complex at their own pace. Um, so you just keep playing that squeeze box, uh, uh, but you'd have to structure it a bit in note form, I think, because you're committing to drawings. And if, and if you've fluffed the ending and it's happened on page 180 of a 200 page book, <laughs> you've got to do a lot of accordion playing to, to fix that. So a lot of pre-planning and basically 
I would thumbnail it. So that's something uh, these guys might not do uh, unless they are working with an illustrator or they have strong village ideas which they then communicate to their illustrator. And by thumbnailing, I mean I do every page this big and I can show you examples of that if you're interested for King Lear. I do every page that big so I kind of know how each page has its own ending and how that builds me towards the ending I need to reach at page 200 by squeezing and relaxing that, that accordion. And I know Jasper is not going to fluff this ending. <laughs> Jasper? Um, no, uh, mm. it, it helps if you have an ending. Uh, I, I've, I've, had, uh, I've written two, two of my books, two out of my 12 books. I, I had a, a good idea of the ending when I started to write the book and they were probably the two easiest books to write. Um, I'll probably think of an ending, hopefully, about two-thirds of the way through. Um, and, and this is a, a, a moment so wonderful that I, I will actually announce it to my, to my wife. And, and I'll say, uh, and she'll say, how, how was it today? You know, how was work today? And I said, it was terrific. I, I've got an ending. In fact, I, I would announce it before she asked, in fact. I said, uh, great day. Uh, I got the ending. And she goes, whoa, like that. Um, and now, quite often, if I'm, if I'm talking to an author, uh, and, um, and I'm saying, how are you? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of midway through a book. And I say, uh, the first thing I say is, have you got an ending? Uh, and they always know exactly what I mean. And they can either say, not yet. And you go, hmm, you know, blast. And they say, actually, I have. And you go, way to go. You know, you're, you're, you're on the downhill slope. It, it, it's, it's a very important part of the book. Uh, and when, when, you, when you ace the ending, um, it's actually a, it's good because it really means, yes, you're on the downhill, downhill, uh, downhill trace. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll agree with me. It's been a, a really fascinating discussion, and I'd like uh, you to join me in thanking these three gentlemen for giving so much of their time Thank you. Uh, and their ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.